All right, my friends, I'm going to tell you right now, a fecal matter transplant, and this is from chat, saying fecal matter, matter transplant might help so many things because your gut microbes train your immune system. They produce neurotransmitters for all of your different, uh, you know, nerve impulses. They digest complex food molecules, break them all down so they can maybe be made up into body parts. They regulate inflammation, so they attack the things that are attacking you. They influence gene expression and epigenetics. Gene expression and epigenetics, they make you what you are. You are a product of, of a program, which is your DNA, and then you have to have all the functions of that DNA programming, the genomics, have to be done by bacteria making the products to make you healthy. The bacteria literally is us. Okay, the old claim was that there was bacterial cells outnumbered human cells 10 to 1 in your body. Now they have a different take on this. Okay, now they say it's like half and half bacteria and human. Well, the human stuff is made by the bacteria. They are the ones that create the products and build these proteins up to create bones and muscles and tendons and all that stuff. So everything that we are is made by the bacteria, and then the bacteria continue to support that structure with enzymes. And it says the bacteria in your gut and elsewhere are not just passengers. They digest fiber, produce vitamins, regulate the immune system, send signals to your brain, protect against pathogens. They're basically the second part of the, of the human body. They're what scientists call the second genome, microbial organ. Bottom line, you're roughly half human, half microbe by cell count, but 100% dependent on both to function. The bacteria create the enzymes. When your human half calls on the, the bacteria to do their job and the enzyme isn't there, you don't get the job done, you're sick. Now the other thing is what different types of bacteria in you and the quantities make you who you are, literally. And that's why we're going through this you know, um, gay situation and, and you know, you're your biological orientation, what actually controls that? And is there bacteria associated to that? Without a database, we will never find out any of this stuff. We need a database. Okay, so the current estimate is we're half microbes and half the body that the microbes built. So the microbes are there just there to facilitate that body staying healthy, feeding it, giving it energy, doing all the things that the body requires is done by the bacterial enzymes. Now, I asked, has glyphosate been tested on bacteria to see if it kills bacteria? Yes, glyphosate has been tested on bacteria and it does affect bacterial growth, though not equally across all types. There's a certain pathway. Here's what they say. Here's what we know. Glyphosate, which is the active in, in Roundup, and they spray it right on the crops right before we eat it. It targets this shikimate pathway, which is in the plant. It's a meta metabolic route used to produce certain amino acids, and these are the amino acids it produces. Without those, you just, it, the plant dies. All right, so the shikimate pathway, it targets that. Now, the plants, fungi, and many bacteria use this pathway. Plants, fungi, and many bacteria. So the bacteria, many of them. Plants is why they're using it. They genetically modify plants so that it doesn't care about that bacteria anymore. It doesn't care about, I mean, about the uh, Roundup anymore. There's a, they change the, the genome in the plant so it's genetically modified to say, we don't even care about that shikimate pathway. We don't care. Don't care about it. Just keep growing. Don't worry about it. Let them spray all that stuff on you. You want no big issue. Just keep growing. And they do. Well, what happens, though, when they spray it on there? Well, the plant absorbs it, obviously. And all of the soils are infected with this killer of 
bacteria and all the other things that grow in the soils, including the weeds. So the weeds are destroyed, which makes the farmer very happy because he doesn't have to pick them out. And the plants just keep growing because they're modified genetically to say, I don't care about this poison. And the poison is all over, and it's poisons in the soil, killing the bacteria in the soil, which is what creates new fertile soils as the bacteria break down. So you're killing the soils, you're killing the weeds, and you're making that plant ingest all of that poison. Now, on top of that, they spray it right onto it, even after they're harvested, so that it dries it out. It's a desiccant, and it does something into that chicanate pathway, but it also sucks all the moisture out of the plants. They can Then they can bring them to market quicker, but they're saturated with this glyphosate. And glyphosate, this is, I'm just reading to you what the research says. This is not me speaking. This is what the research says about glyphosate, which is the Roundup, and the bacteria. It kills the bacteria, not all of it. Some of it don't use that pathway, but the ones that do are. And the ones that you do use it are very susceptible. And the ones that don't use it are the ones that infect you, it appears. Now, C. difficile is basically resistant to glyphosate, where lactobacillus, which you something you very desperately need, is very resistant, is, is, gets harmed by it. All right, I'm just gonna read to you what it says, and I'll comment on what I have to say. It says that the, the glyphosate, glyphosate can inhibit or kill bacteria, especially those that rely on that shikimate pathway. Now listen to this. Different bacteria species respond differently. Some beneficial gut bacteria, like lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, appear more sensitive to glyphosate. It kills it. These are the ones you really need desperately. Now, some potentially harmful bacteria like C. difficile and Salmonella seem more resistant. All right, they resist the effects of that. This means glyphosate could, in theory, disrupt the microbiome balance in the soils, in the animals, and even in humans. Well, especially in humans, where people's guts are getting destroyed. They got all kind of gut distrust. That's why you see so much of the probiotics on the market now. And they are something that's important, but it's just not understood. We need to do a, a, a research project of what is the natural, normal bacterial level in the body of all these different bacterias, and then come up with a solution as to this database, finding out which ones are good and bad. And you could probably take a picture of your poop with a certain app which would look for all the different frequencies of, of light that bounce back, send that picture to AI, AI would look at it and say, these are the different bacterial strains you have in your body, and this one's high, this one's low, this one's whatever, and give you a profile almost instantly, and it would say you're lacking this one or you've got too much of that. And you could do this almost daily. I, I, if you could just have to take a picture of it, you could do it 10 times a day. But these are the kind of things that disrupt your microbiome, and your microbiome can cause you all kinds of distress within one hour. It takes one hour for enzymes that are being destroyed and, and hurt to all this, make you feel those effects. And sometimes they're extremely serious within one hour of being infected by something. Now, this is what Secretary Kennedy's talking about is these environmental factors. Well, this is back in 2015. Showed that glycosate-based herbicides altered bacterial populations in vitro and may affect the gut. In vitro just means in a dish. But it's, if it infects in a dish, it might affect it in the gut. Well, they found that it does. 2018, they found glycosate exposure altered gut microbiota composition in rats' guts. But the, these, they, they modify these creatures to be very similar to humans, so they have similar responses. Now, glyphosate suppressed this Enterococcus strains, which protect against pathogens. So now you become more susceptible to pathogens. The only reason I could think of, if it gives you a, lose, you lose protection against all pathogens, would be that it would cause some kind of a problem with your tight membrane junctions. So all the membranes in your body that protect different organs and skin, you know, everything, get loosened and then you can poke through there. 
But that's what pathogens do. They infect down into your vital flesh. And the membrane is supposed to keep them out. And the membrane is where you have all this bacteria, but you're killing the bacteria so you don't have the enzymes. No. Just like because they kill bacteria, yes, it can, especially those vulnerable shikimate, the ones I just talked about, very important ones. It doesn't wipe out all bacteria. The, the harmful ones continue to grow. What's the implications? Soil health, livestock digestion, all these chicken flus and bird viruses and all kinds of things are from microbiome issues and microbes. And we have to test for those microbes. Human gut microbes, especially with dietary exposure. You're, everybody now is being exposed to this GMO altered stuff, which means they can spray the glyphosate on it. So they're being soaked with glyphosate. Just think of it that way. You see this? This is the glyphosate again. I asked, do they spray glyphosate on the crops during harvest and directly after? Yes, glyphosate sometimes sprayed on crops shortly before harvest. If they use it, they're going to use it in a practice called pre-harvest desiccation. But this depends on a crop and the country's regulations. I don't think they have any regulation about it in the United States. And what does that do? Why spray glyphosate before harvest? Well, we can sell them quicker to kill and dry down the crop uniformly. It makes mechanical harvesting easier and more efficient. To kill the weeds that might go to seed, so you try to kill off all the weeds. Spread, speed up harvesting in cold or wet climates where timing is critical. Common crops treated this way. Wheat, oats, barley, lentils, peas, canola, sugarcane, sometimes non-GMO corn and soybeans, even non-GMO. This is, not most, this is mostly not about weed control. This is about drying it out. It's to make the plants die and dry out in sync so farmers can harvest everything at once. Is it used after harvest? Not typically. Spraying after harvest doesn't help much. The crop is already off the field. Post-harvest spraying is more common for weed control before the next planting. Where is this most common? Canada and U.S. and parts of Europe use pre-harvest glyphosate, especially in grain farming. So that's Canada, U.S. and parts of Europe. Organic crops do not allow glyphosate use at any stage whatsoever. In some regions, the practice is banned or heavily restricted due to concerns over glyphosate residue in food. Costa Rica, I was talking to somebody that has a place down there, and I was looking into Costa Rica, they don't allow any fertilizers or anything. None of this stuff, not even fertilizers, because you're messing with the natural ecosystem. Health concerns. Why glycosate is applies close to harvest is a higher chance of residue ending up in the food. There's no chance it's there, especially in grain cereals and legumes. This has sparked regulatory laws that loose it, lawsuits demand for glyphosate free products and trust me well anyway yes glyphosate is often sprayed shortly before harvest on certain crops to dry them out evenly it's not typically sprayed after harvest and its use varies widely by crop country and farming practice the the bacteria in the human body is being affected by a, a whole host of things. It's not just glyphosate. That's just a little drop in a bucket. Well, it's a big drop in in, in a in a bucket, in a fairly small bucket. That's a big drop because when you're eating stuff that's already been saturated with with bacteria killers, what what do you expect to happen? You're eating it. Okay, there's always a way to solve a problem. If we have a strain of bacteria, can we cultivate that strain? Yes, absolutely. If you have a strain of bacteria, you can cultivate it, provided you know a couple of key things about the growth requirements. It's a key standard practice in microbiology and biotechnology. All we need to do is isolate which strains are causing which problems, and then we just Cultivate them. You don't have to take a fecal matter transplant and have all kinds of stuff go in from anybody. Once you know what the strains are, you say you're low on this strain and everybody that's healthy has way up here, you're way down here. You give them some of that strain and see if they start to come back up or go wherever they're supposed to with that particular bacteria. 
You're just cultivating it. You don't have to take a whole batch from a certain person every time and give every all of that stuff at once. No. That's currently the way it's being done. But once we had a database, we would know which bacteria are causing which problems. It's as simple as that. It's, this is, and th that takes care of the ethical issues. You're not just splattering like a machine gun every little bit and piece that's in somebody's gut. You're targeting this particular bacteria, which we know has a certain influence. All right? I love you all. We should get this done.